Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson is titled Mission to the Powerful. It's ready for teaching on December 2 and is number 9 in the series God's Mission, Our Mission. Your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who works through the reading of your word. And as we read your word this week, that we pray that each of us may be blessed, but each of us may see our opportunity to share your love and your grace with those around us. Lord, I'd like to pray for those who are visually impaired, those who have other health problems that make it difficult for them to read, and as they listen this week, may they be truly blessed by your word. I also would like to pray for everyone who's listening, but today particularly for Robert Atkinson and his parents, for Mara Francis and Gerinald, for Nasus Sunifath and Dalton, Alton and Ian, who are brothers, and for Emma Hernandez in Texas, and also from Texas in Houston, and Klein. Lord, I pray you'll bless each of these people, and Sybil Johnson in Jamaica, and her neighbour who has diabetes. Lord, we're reaching out to people wherever we live, and as we study this lesson about reaching out, we pray that your grace will flow from us to those around us. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Matthew 16 and verse 20. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's read that again, Matthew 16, verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Though written many years ago, the Bible The Word of God is the revelation of God's truth for our world. And among the many truths it reveals is that of human nature and that whether in 7th century Judea or 21st century Brazil, people are basically the same, sinners in need of divine grace. This includes the rich and powerful. The rich and powerful of Bible times were no different from the rich and powerful in modern times, especially in their pursuit of wealth and fame and power, often but not always at the expense of the vulnerable. Yet God is as concerned about the salvation of the rich and the powerful as he is for those of the weak and the needy. Scripture provides some gripping examples of Bible characters who were powerful or rich or both and how God used them to be a blessing to the nations, such as Abraham, Isaac, Job, Solomon and Joseph, to name a few examples. This week, we will explore God's mission to the rich and powerful. Journey with us as we see how God reached some of these people and how he is calling and preparing Seventh-day Adventists to be a witness to them today as well. Sunday, November 26, Nebuchadnezzar. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in what is known as unlimited atonement. This means that, in contrast to some Christians, we believe that Christ's death was for all humanity, not just a special group of those predestined by God for salvation. Because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, we read in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world, we read also in 1 John 2 verse 2. That's why everyone was chosen in him before the foundation of the world, as it says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, even if not everyone chooses him in return. That's why, too, we find accounts in the Bible of all sorts of people being reached for God. Read Daniel chapter 4. What happened to the king here, and what does this tell us about salvation coming to one of the world's most powerful men? 
This chapter is titled, Nebuchadnezzar's Second Dream. We begin at verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, and how mighty his wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from the generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But, at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and its interpretation." These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the fields found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts as the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation." since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king." who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. 
They shall drive you from men, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. And, inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you, after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity." All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the twelve months, he was walking around the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses." That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom My honour and splendour returned to me. My counsellors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of Heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down." a striking example in the Bible of how God reaches powerful unbelievers is this story of King Nebuchadnezzar. God's judgment was executed on him in a way similar to some Israelite kings. For example, we see in 2 Chronicles 32 verses 25 and 26, But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favour shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And also in 1 Kings 14, verses 21 to 31, Rehoboam reigns in Judah, it's titled, and Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonites. Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishka, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. 
Then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard, who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Nama, an Ammonitess. Then Abijam, his son, ruled in his place. And First Samuel chapter 28 And this is where Saul consults the medium. Now, it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servants can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So... Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you seek me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you today. Moreover, The Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. 
And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands, and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now therefore, please, heed also the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you, and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it, and she took flour and kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they arose and went away that night." The biblical account of Nebuchadnezzar, who comes to his senses and acknowledges the Creator God, shows that God cares about the wealthy and powerful, as well as the weak and needy. In verse 37, the most powerful man on the earth declared, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down in Daniel 4.37. If only all the rich and powerful and haughty among us mortal beings understood this truth. What can we learn from this story? First, God uses committed believers such as Daniel as a bridge to reach powerful unbelievers. Second, God can directly intervene in the witnessing process in order to reach powerful unbelievers. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by God for his pride and arrogance, and, though this was a very dramatic story, there are many other ways in which the rich and powerful and haughty can be brought low. And so, to finish the day, even if we are not rich and powerful by the world's standards, why must we be careful to avoid the kind of arrogance that this king had manifested? Why might that attitude be easier to have than we might think? Monday, November 27, Naaman. Christ died for all, regardless of their background, wealth, ethnicity or status. God ceaselessly draws all humanity to himself, including those individuals classed among the powerful non-Christians of the world. As you read in Ellen White's comments in The Acts of the Apostles, page 416, few realize the full meaning of the words that Christ spoke when, in the synagogue at Nazareth, he announced himself as the Anointed One. He declared his mission to comfort, bless, and save the sorrowing and the sinful, and then, seeing that pride and unbelief controlled the hearts of his hearers, he reminded them that in time past God had turned away from his chosen people because of their unbelief and rebellion, and had manifested himself to those in heathen lands who had not rejected the light of heaven." The widow of Sarapata and Naaman the Syrian had lived up to all the light they had. Hence, they were accounted more righteous than God's chosen people who had backslidden from him and had sacrificed principle to convenience and worldly honour. Read Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 to 19. What can we take from this story about reaching people for the Lord? And this one is titled Naaman's Leprosy Healed. We begin in chapter 5 of Second Kings at verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honourable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valour, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. 
Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he went to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came back and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more then, when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, I now know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So... Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimon. When I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said, Go in peace. So he departed with him a short distance. In 2 Kings chapter 5, 17 to 19, Naaman made two unusual requests after God healed him of leprosy. First, he asked to take two mule loads of earth from Israel back to Syria for the purpose of worshipping the living God. He states, For your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to the other gods, but to the Lord. Though Naaman is clearly now a believer in the only true God, his first request shows that pagan influences still held sway over his thinking to a degree. The Syrian commander regarded the God of Israel as a divinity who must be venerated on soil native to that land. Although Naaman acknowledged the reality that there was no God aside from the Lord of Israel, he had not wholly dispossessed himself of the notion that God was, by some particular means, connected to the land of Israel. Thus, in his own country, he desired to worship God on Israelite soil. Naaman's second petition shows the sincerity of his faith. While he resolved to serve only the God of heaven, he realized carrying out such a resolution in his own idolatrous country wouldn't be easy. Moreover, the king of Syria still worshipped the god of Rimon, and in his occupation, Nathan would serve as the king's escort. While Naaman had no intention of forsaking his duties to his earthly king, he did not wish to be deemed as bowing in worship to Rimon. Having surrendered his heart to Jehovah, Naaman desired not to make any concessions to idolatry by worshipping the heathen god. Nor did he want word to get back to Elisha that he was doing so. Elisha responded to Naaman's entreaty by saying, 
Go in peace, in verse 19. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 878, we read, These words must not be thought of as either expressing approval or disapproval of Nathan's parting request. He was to depart in peace, not in doubt or restless uncertainty. God had been kind to him, and he was to find happiness and peace in his knowledge and worship of God. Naaman was a new convert, a man with conscientious scruples who would grow in strength and wisdom if he clung to his newfound faith. God leads new converts on step by step and knows the appropriate moment in which to call for a reform in a certain matter. This principle ought always to be borne in mind by those who labour for the salvation of souls. End of quote. And that brings us to the end of today's lesson with these questions. What lessons should we learn from this story about not pushing people too quickly, especially those who come from a non-Christian background? Tuesday, November 28, Witnessing to the Learned Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a learned man. The Bible describes him as a ruler of the Jews in John chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus referred to him as a teacher of Israel in John 3, verse 10. He had a good understanding of the Bible and had a spiritual hunger for the Lord. From a human perspective, he may have looked as though he were a follower of God. He kept all the commandments, and he was a respected leader among the Jews. He was powerful and wealthy. Many looked at these as signs that God had blessed him. Nevertheless, it turns out that the surface appearances were only that, surface appearances. Read John chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. What does this story reveal about Nicodemus' spiritual needs and how Jesus addressed them right away? John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he tried to maintain the facade, the status quo. But God knew his heart. Similarly, God knows the hearts and needs of all the rich and powerful, whatever their background. Nicodemus came to Jesus because Jesus' teachings had convicted him. His pride kept him from openly confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, but that night changed him forever. Even after his conviction that Jesus was sent of God, he still did not openly acknowledge that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. Read John chapter 7, verses 43 to 52, and John 19, verse 39. What do these texts tell us about Nicodemus and Jesus? John 7, beginning at verse 43. So, there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then, 
The officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spake like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. And John chapter 19, verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. We can see here in these verses that Nicodemus had obviously been greatly impacted by Jesus. He sought to protect him when Jesus was alive, and then to honour Jesus after Jesus was dead. No question, Jesus had reached Nicodemus, who, even in his vaunted knowledge and wisdom, had a great need of the Saviour, as we all do. And so to finish today, why must we be careful of the trap of thinking that because we have the truth, which we do, then the knowledge of this truth alone is enough to save us? How many souls will be lost who have more than enough knowledge, even of the three angels' messages, to be saved? Wednesday, November 29, Mission to the Rich. Read Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 24. What lessons can we learn from this story in which, in contrast to Nicodemus, a person did not accept Jesus? Matthew 19, beginning at verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But... When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler shows just how dangerous a trap wealth can be. Look at these words in Matthew 19, 24. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This, of course, does not mean the rich cannot be saved, but only that if these people are not careful, their riches can truly be an impediment to salvation. In the end, the rich and the poor face the same fate, the grave. This means that the rich are in as desperate need of salvation as is anyone else. Whatever else money can buy, it cannot buy an exemption from death. That exemption comes only as a gift offered freely by Jesus to whomever will claim it by faith. John 11.25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Read Luke 19, 1-10. What made the difference in this story in contrast to the one about the rich young ruler? Well, let's go to Luke 19, and we'll begin at verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. 
And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus responded to Jesus in a way that, unfortunately, the rich young ruler didn't. Notice, Jesus didn't tell Zacchaeus to sell what he had and give to the poor as he did to the rich young ruler. Jesus must have known just how tied to his money the rich ruler was, which was why Jesus said what he did to him. In contrast, though we don't know all that was spoken when Jesus was in his house, Zacchaeus obviously was convicted by Jesus and knew that he had to make some changes in his life, especially as it related to his wealth. And we finish today with Matthew 16:26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What should these words say to us all? Thursday, November 30, Mission to the Powerful Jesus knew how to make friends with the powerful. He was admired and respected by many of these people, and at the same time was also despised by many. The powerful people in the Bible who came to Jesus for help surely sensed that he cared for them. Also, many of the rich and powerful did not openly come to Jesus right away. They waited until they were certain that Jesus was truly the Son of God. Such was the case both with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Read Matthew 25, verses 57 to 60. Also look at Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. What does this account tell us about how the Lord used a rich man who clearly had been impacted by Jesus? First of all, Matthew 27, beginning at verse 57. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And then Mark 15, verses 43 to 47. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marvelled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. And Luke 23, verses 50 to 53. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever lain before. 
and John 19 verses 38 to 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was near by. Until this time, we've heard nothing of Joseph of Arimathea. Suddenly, this rich man appears, almost out of nowhere, and is used to help fulfil prophecy. God had used and will continue to use the rich for his purposes. Hence, we must have a mission to them as well. Where to begin can be one of the most difficult phases in making friends with powerful people. In general, it is better not to pursue them. Let them come to you. Jesus did this. They became a witness to his message, healing and power from God. They were convinced behind the scenes that he is truly the Son of God. Powerful people will seek to partner with genuine ministry for a number of reasons. They want to be part of something good that is changing the lives of people. This is one way they know that it can also change their lives. It provides a subtle way for the rich and powerful to get the help they need without publicly disclosing their needs. The second phase is to begin a genuine ministry as an avenue for the rich and powerful to be part of God's ministry. Take some time to invest in the lives of the rich and powerful in your society. And that brings us to close the day with challenge. Add someone to your daily prayer list who is in a position of power, is not a believer, and is someone you could come in contact with from time to time. And challenge up. Address a letter or email to someone in a position of power, even if it is someone you may never have met, and tell that person that you are praying for him or her. Friday, December 1. Jesus' love is the same for the poor as it is for the rich and powerful people in the world. He died for the princes as well as for paupers. Jesus knew the most effective way of reaching their hearts. He warned us that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God in Mark 10.25. We are challenged this week to reach powerful and wealthy individuals with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are as much in need of salvation as is anyone else, even if, unfortunately, they may not realise it because of the security that they believe their wealth offers. From Ministry of Healing, page 210, we read, Much is said concerning our duty to the neglected poor. Should not some attention be given to the neglected rich? Many look upon this class as hopeless. Thousands of wealthy men have gone to their graves unwarned, but indifferent as they may appear, many among the rich are soul burdened. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Jesus broke down caste and class barriers when ministering to the rich and the poor during his earthly ministry. How do we as Adventists address this issue, that of the gap between the rich and the poor, that is so ingrained in all our societies? 2. Jesus said the following in Matthew 13.22, Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. What do you think Jesus meant by the deceitfulness of riches? Why do we not necessarily have to be rich to be deceived by riches? 
Three, in class, go over the question asked at the end of Tuesday's study about the fact that knowing the truth is not the same thing as being saved by it. Why is this such a crucial distinction for us to make? If knowing the truth alone is not what saves us, what does save us? And four, what other reasons can you think of for why the rich young ruler rejected Jesus while Zacchaeus accepted him? Mission Path to Spain, Part 3, by Andrew McChesney. Pastor Louis Paver miraculously received US dollars to pay off a debt, leading him to believe that God's will was for him, his wife, and their three children to leave Venezuela, but they didn't have any savings. Lord, how do I leave with no savings, he prayed. At home, his wife said a pastor in the United States had called, wanting to speak with him. The pastor was looking for a volunteer missionary to work for a year in an area of Mexico without a Seventh-day Adventist presence. Louis went to Mexico and his wife and children joined him two months later. Over the next eight months, 35 people were baptised through Louis's efforts. One new member donated a building and a new church was opened. But the authorities denied Louis a visa to stay in Mexico. He seemed to only have two options, move to the United States illegally or stay in Mexico illegally. He didn't want to live anywhere illegally. Louis had become acquainted with a regional immigration official. When the official heard about Louis's situation, he promised not to deport him. Louis believed him, but he believed God even more when God said, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. From Psalm 146 verse 3. Worried, Louis prayed. He also made phone calls to the United States and Canada, seeking legal advice on leaving Mexico. Only two churches replied, an Adventist church and another church, both in Canada. But Louis remained in Mexico. Then a church member visited his home. What's your biggest fear? the man asked. I don't want to live illegally in Mexico, and I don't want to travel illegally to the United States, Louis replied. I also don't want to return to my country. If you had the money, what would you do right now? The man asked. I would buy a plane ticket to fly to Spain, Louis said. Louis had a same age aunt who had immigrated to Spain 20 years earlier. If he moved, he would have a family member nearby. Also, he had visited Spain three years earlier and felt comfortable there. After listening to Louis, the church member said, So, let's buy the tickets and have you fly to Spain. After buying plane tickets for Louis and his family, he told Louis not to worry. God is with you and is leading you, he said. Today, Louis and his wife are missionaries in Spain. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offering that helps support missionaries around the world. Next week we will read about how Louis left a fruit stand to become a missionary. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.